Hi, everyone. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes. We still have some people uh, logging in. And I think it's a good uh, time to get started with this. So I'll jump right in. So what can you guys expect today? We'll do an introduction. I've got some incredible guests, um, professionals, experts in the field. Uh, so I'll give you an introduction for them. And then we're going to talk about the foundation of my real estate portfolio. So we'll get into the principles and the, you know, kind of the strategies I've used to really accumulate a, a successful portfolio. Uh, and that's with pre-construction condos, that's with leverage, that's with refinancing. And then we'll get into uh, tax deferrals and corporate structures and why it's so important to, you know, approach building a real estate portfolio from, uh, you know, uh, the, the correct, I guess, tax uh, advantage. And then I'll talk about how I applied these principles to build a, a $19 million, $500,000 portfolio. And then we'll introduce uh, Joanna Lang of Outline Financial, and we'll talk about financing pre-construction condos, leveraging your deposit to build serious wealth. Uh, we'll talk about OPM and HELOCs. It's other people's money and home equity lines of credit. And refi and repeat, refinance and repeat. Keep doing it, keep buying more, and keep accumulating wealth. Um, and then we'll talk about real estate tax strategies, which I think is often overlooked in the whole kind of uh, real estate investing um, um, uh, architecture, I guess. And I think it's really important uh, early on to, to have the right tax strategy in place, whether that's a corporate structure or whatever. Um, so we'll get into all of those. And there's the four types of, of owning real estate or four types of real estate ownership, uh, investing in a holding corp. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about tax savings tips and we will talk about uh, answering all your questions at the end. So we'll try to keep this within an hour. I'm gonna fly through my part of this presentation. These are my guests, these are experts. I wanna leverage their experience and expertise. So um, I will go through it quickly and then we'll be able to answer your questions at the end. Um, so myself, Ryan Coyle, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the broker and co-founder of connect.ca Realty. I've been a real estate investor for over 20 years from the age of 20. I've been a real estate broker for 15 years now. Uh, founder and owner of connect.ca Realty, Marco Toronto, One Day Money. Uh, my team is a top producing uh, resale team, platinum VIP team. And my current portfolio sits around 35 doors and a value of over $19 million. Uh, Joanna Lang is the managing partner of Outline Financial. Um, this is huge. She's a top 75 brokers in Canada, but last year she was number six. Uh, that's significant. Uh, over 20 years in finance, founder and co-owner of Outline Financial and the 2020 Mortgage Broker of the Year. And Peter, who is also my accountant, um, Peter Edry, over 30 years of experience as a tax specialist and business advisor, uh, including my business advisor, uh, founder and owner of Accounting Plus, CRA, handles CRA reviews, appeals, taxpayer reliefs, cash flow analysis, uh, and most importantly, manages corporate and personal tax returns, owner managed businesses in various industries, including retail, manufacturing, real estate, investing, and more. So I'll jump right into it. And, and again, I'm just going to touch on my strategies and I think the principles around the foundation for my real estate portfolio and, and why pre-construction is such a big part of it. And a lot of you have seen my presentations before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I'm going to go through it and I'm going to get to the special guests. Uh, but I think it is important to have an understanding of kind of the foundation for building a real estate portfolio. And uh, I will go through it quickly. And tomorrow, uh, I'm not getting into any of the uh, market updates. Uh, well, I guess I will a little bit, but uh, not much. I have a recent webinar we did. It has a really great market update for Toronto and um, different markets. So I will send that out with the recording tomorrow of this uh, webinar. Sorry, let me go back here. Why everyone should invest in pre-construction condos. Well, pre-construction is the ultimate leverage. So you can, it allows you to invest without a mortgage. What that means is you can buy a condo, put down a deposit on a condo and take advantage of the full amount of leverage. So you're not actually taking out a mortgage until the condo is ready in four or five years. And, you know, by the time, uh, historically speaking, that you take out a mortgage, you have price and rent appreciation with serious equity. 
So when you actually close on it, take out the mortgage, you're in a very comfortable cash flow position because rents have increased from when you actually put down an original deposit. But most importantly, you have a large amount of capital appreciation, which puts you in a good position to get financing or to refinance quickly and then repeat. Uh, and then just to give you an idea of the numbers uh, for pre-construction, GTA pre-con condo five-year average is 13%. So that's across the, the entire GTA versus the, uh, the five-year average for detached is 11. 6% and the uh, average for existing condos 7.1%. In downtown Toronto, the five year average for GTA condos is 15%, 11.4% for detached, 7.5 or 6.51 for existing condos. And over the long term, the, the 45 year average is 6.66% compounded annual growth. So, um, you know, when you factor in leverage, those returns are significantly higher. And the reason why I want to point this out with the pre-con numbers is you're not actually buying a condo. If you're to invest today, you're putting down a deposit on a hugely appreciating piece of paper where you sign and then you go put it in your, your filing cabinet for five years and you forget about it. And what's, you know, my point here is that it's actually outperforming the rest of the market and, and by a long shot. So you're getting the full amount of leverage. Uh, you're not paying any interest on that leverage and you're outperforming the market. Um, and then it helps you create passive income, income while, while you sleep. And just to put that in perspective, the, the average Canadian salary last year in 2020 was $54,640. The average GTA condo price is $624,000. If you add 13% appreciation to that, you will make, add to your net worth, $81,235 in annual appreciation alone. That's not factoring any cash flow or, or rental payments or anything like that. So that's a significant number. And, and this is really why I've decided to invest in, in, in multiple properties and pre-construction because it allows me to create many of those uh, you know, annual appreciations, not just the one. And it's an easy hands-free way to build serious wealth. So, uh, you know, the first five years, three, four, five years, it's sitting in your filing cabinet, you're doing nothing, you're just getting appreciation. And then when the condo is ready, these are new condos, they have warranties, and uh, you get a good tenant, especially if you're in downtown Toronto, and you don't really hear from them. So people are uh, refi, buy, and repeat, leverage refinancing and deferring taxes. Most people don't know this, and, and, and I always find it fascinating um, because they should know this, and this is one of the best kept secrets, but people are actually sitting on a pile of cash in their primary residence, and you can borrow against your primary residence, pull out money, and you could actually use that as a tax deduction if you're using that to go and invest. Equity in your property isn't working for you if it's sitting there. Make it work hard. So that just you know, shows to the, the point above you have money if you have owned a house for some, some years now, uh, the market has gone up and you have access to cash that'll allow you to create that scenario I just showed where you can add an extra $81,000 to your net worth every year or buy three condos and, and, and times that by three. Uh, refinancing is the best tax deferral to ever exist. Peter, if, if you know of a better one, please jump in. My point here is that every time I refinance my condo, I do not pay taxes. I know I will have to pay taxes, whether that's in one year, it's whenever I sell the condo, whether that's in one year or 100 years, but it allows me to have more money in my pocket to reinvest often versus selling the property. Short-term versus long-term investing. I'm in this for the long-term game and I'll go over this later, but um, you know, I, I really minimize my risk by investing for the long-term. You know, the five-year average, which I just showed you, was 13%. Um, there could have been a bad year. It could have been down 13%. But what I can tell you is when you look at the long-term averages, which have many ups and downs in them, real estate has outperformed um, when you factor in, in leverage and everything, any other asset class. And cash flow versus capital appreciation, I will get into that when I show you my, my portfolio. But to the other examples I already provided, capital appreciation, what it's all about to build serious wealth. And then we'll look at my portfolio and turn, how I turn one property. Uh, well, the multiplier effect is something we've self-coined and we create. And it was always my goal to buy one property and turn it into uh, multiple properties. And that's obviously served, served me well. So the multiplier effect. Uh, I love this quote. It's from Albert Einstein. I'm sure most of you know him. Um, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it earns it. 
he who doesn't pays it. And I don't know if he was a real estate investor. I haven't read anything about that, but he was an incredibly smart person. And Albert Einstein's talking about compound interest is one of the wonders of the world. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm listening and, you know, I'll show you this in action. And this is the multiplier effect in action and compound interest. And uh, with this example, I'm, I'm using a, an original purchase price of 450,000, which would be $90,000 to invest out of your pocket. And with the multiplier effect and refinancing, you use leverage and a capital appreciation to refinance the property in year six. In this scenario, I used a 6% uh, compounded annual growth rate. And that allows you to buy property, you refinance property one, buy property two and three in year six. Your portfolio is now worth 1.734 million. In year 12, you refinance property one, two, three to buy properties four, five, and six with no more money out of your pocket. So you're pulling out the money without selling it. You're deferring the tax from the, the appreciation until you sell all of your properties. Year 12, you got a portfolio of 4.6, but then this is compound interest in action. In, in year 25, you've got a portfolio value of $8.7 million. Uh, there's a mortgage still in this assumption, which means you have equity of $7.5 million. Now, I would like to um, show you guys just an example of, of refinancing a pre-construction condo, what it looks like, because this is exactly what I'm working on right now. I purchased this property in April 2017. The final close date is April 15th of this year, so it's four years later. The appraised value is now $950,000. I have it rented at $3,200, and the current mortgage, uh, when I take out the mortgage, is $482,000. Um, so the current mortgage, when I take out the mortgage, will be $482,000. And this number here at the bottom is what's important here. The appraised value is $950,000. So I'll take out 80% loan to value, which is $760,000. And then I'll pay off the mortgage, which is $482,000. And that'll leave me with... Um, uh, of, of money to reinvest of $277,000. So this is an example of how you uh, use the, the refinancing a multiplier. Um, so this is an example of my portfolio. This is all of the property, the doors that I own. Some of these are multi-units. Um, and they have multiple doors and I have a rough, uh, you know, net worth, or I shouldn't say net worth portfolio value of $19.5 million. And really I want to, to bring the focus on cash flow versus capital appreciation here. If I had focused on cash flow, I would have way less properties, but because I've focused on leverage and buying more and more real estate to make that extra $81,000 per year per property that has allowed me to use equity to continue to grow my portfolio. And, you know, my portfolio is worth 19.5 million. I have mortgages on that and I'm actually cash flow negative. I'm in a position where I'm able to be negative um, because I have a lot of capital from the refinances sitting in my bank account, but I'm also using that as a, a to lower my tax. Uh, my tax liability. So because I'm, I'm taking uh, a loss on some of them in terms of cash flow, my tax liability is actually less and it's allowed me to buy more property. So this is where I'm focusing on a long-term goal here where I, I'm trying to build serious wealth over the long-term. And just to show this with the compounded interest again, if I use a 3% compounded annual growth rate, my current value of 19,500,000 in 20 years would be $35 million dollars. In 30 years, it would be 47 million. And to show you the difference of, you know, the 45 year average of 6.6% uh, compounding annual growth, which I think is very realistic, especially given the, the, the 15 year average is around 8% uh, right now. I'm looking at a portfolio value of 1, 133 million in, uh, in 30 years, which is a significant number. You're gonna have a lot of work to do for me there, Peter and Joanna. Mm -hmm. um, so the summary here, uh, before I hand it over is, is what investing in real estate is for me. And it's, it's really about creating the, creating multi-generational wealth. When I first started becoming successful in investing in real estate, um, 
and, and accumulating wealth, I knew it was important for me to pass this on to my children, to my grandchildren. And then that really became what was a, a main focus for me was to create wealth, to be able to pass it on to the next generation and, um, you know, be able to give them, you know, opportunities that not necessarily everyone has, especially as the housing market appreciates the way it does. And it was really about creating my own pension. I, at a young age, had a lot of teachers in my family and they focused, uh, they were always bragging about their summers off and having a pension. And I knew I'd never have a pension because I wanted to be an entrepreneur at a young age. And this is really where that started for me and why I wanted the, the 10 condos to really fund my pension. And obviously I've had more success than that. Um, leverage a larger asset base versus focusing on cash flow now. So I'm in this for the long term. I'm looking at accumulating massive amounts of wealth. It's not about helping my cash flow right now. And you know, when you talk about cash flow negative real estate, some people get really freaked out. But what I can tell you is a lot of people are investing X amount of dollars in their mutual funds every month into their RESP for their children or their RSP. And by doing it this way, um, you're, you're just putting money into a, a highly appreciating asset. So I think this is the way to do it. And you know, I'm going to finish off by just saying investing in real estate is simple, but it isn't easy. All of the things I just walked through very quickly, and, and I'm happy to answer all of your questions later um, via email or phone or, or the Q&A. But the reason why I've had success and I have a portfolio of, of worth 19500000 is because it isn't easy. Um, it's a simple formula, but I've had to figure things out and I've had to find people to work with and I've had to work with the right people to help guide me to be able to do this. And, and if it was easy, everyone would have a portfolio of $19,500,000. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to discourage you. It is easy with the right team. Um, there's always going to be challenges with financing and, um, and things like that. But, you know, with the right team, it just makes it much easier. And, you know, leveraging the right team really does make real estate easy. And, you know, I'll end off by saying uh, my favorite quote, do or do not, there is no try. Uh, Yoda was a very wise person from the Star Wars, uh, Empire Strikes Back. And um, I think it's really important. Most people get caught up in, um, you know, kind of over annual analyzing properties and investments. And, you know, next Christmas will probably be an excellent time to invest in real estate, but it's not going to be as good as investing in it today. So on that note, I would love to hand it over to Joanna and uh, Joanna will be able to walk us through the process of investing in, in pre-construction and getting it financed. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Um, so I, um, I'm gonna focus on uh, new construction condos specifically in this presentation. And um, I'm gonna walk you through different stages of the new construction buying process. Uh, so, it, the aspects here that we're gonna um, we're going to review is um, uh, we're gonna go through four steps here: uh, deposit, sources, options, and considerations; lawyer review, what to ask for and why it matters; occupancy stage, uh, steps to take uh, as an investor; registration stage, final mortgage structure and options; other financing considerations, options, and ideas. So uh, typically when you're purchasing an investment property, minimum down payment required is 20%. Uh, when it comes to new construction projects, uh, usually um, it's possible to negotiate a, a deposit structure where first 15% of the purchase price uh, is due within the first typically 12 months and the other 5% is due at occupancy. Uh, which is uh, when the condo is built and when you get the keys to the unit. When it comes to sources of deposits, um, obviously clients can use their own funds to, uh, to, to put a down payment on the property. Uh, but what it uh, limits is that that cash is not growing in terms of, you know, if you had cash in, a, in, an, in an account, you're able to invest that and, and have it grow. But more so, you don't have a tax write-off. Uh, it is possible to uh, do an equity takeout from your principal residence or other investment property. Uh, if you do have equity, uh, we can take a look at um, you know, qualifying criteria and try to access some of the equity in your home. The positive things there are that you are borrowing to invest and then you're writing off that interest as well over the period of time until the condo is ready. 
Um, um, Joanna, do you, do you find um, like when clients of yours are buying pre-construction condos, where do their deposits typically come from? Is it kind of a mix of, you know, refinancing or just savings? Uh, most clients um, actually do not use their own funds. Uh, my experience has been that even if they have money sitting in investments, they'll keep that sitting and they'll take money out of their home equity line of credit uh, because then they can, um, they'll have an expense that they can use against their income for the next four years while they wait for the condo to be ready. Right. By the way, they can actually claim the, the interest while they are... Uh... They should be able to claim the interest on their personal income tax. So it actually lowers, they took. Their, it lowers their taxable income while they're able to invest in more real estate. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Very well said. Thank you. So we're gonna uh, we're going to review a, a deposit example. Uh, we're using a sample purchase price of five hundred thousand, just for for easy math here, with a five year um, time horizon until registration. And registration is when you get the title of a condo and you close on a property. Uh, so for a new build condo on a purchase price of 500,000, uh, you're going to need to do $75,000 in deposits in year one, and another 25,000 at the time of occupancy. Um, and I just want to point out that this isn't always the deposit, sometimes it's lower. Often it's more, it can range anywhere from 10 to 20%, but this is the most common deposit structure right now with 15% five on occupancy. Thank you. Uh, for source of deposit in this example, we use the home equity line of credit on clients existing uh, property. Uh, and we are using a line of credit rate of prime plus half to do our calculations. Um, so what we wanted to uh, illustrate is, um, how that um, can work out over a five-year period. We've uh, made an assumption uh, based on historical uh, property values. We assumed appreciation, uh, property appreciation of 5% a year, which is lower than historical, but obviously that can fluctuate. Uh, source of deposit uh, being $75,000 in year one from the home equity line of credit and 25,000 at the beginning of year five when client went into occupancy. Um, and when I look at that $500,000 uh, condo appreciating 5% a year, at the end of year five, that property is worth $638,141. And that said, uh, I did, you know, use $100,000 from the HELOC to, um, for the deposits, but what it cost me out of my pocket is just the interest on the payments on the uh, home equity line of credit. And, and, when and I think that's what, that, that's what's so important here is that when you're, you're borrowing money to reinvest, your re return on investment is significantly higher because your, your, your really own cost out of pocket is the interest to pay that, um, uh, the HELOC, but then you're also using that as a tax deduction. So it actually becomes <laughs> less than the amount of money that you're paying into the interest or the, uh, the to the, the loan every month. Yeah, thank you, exactly. And uh, in this case scenario, you know, by the time um, it comes to registrations five years ago, uh, we have basically made $12,000 in interest payments to the HELOC uh, and we have a property that's appreciated uh, 126,000 before we even um, close on the purchase. Yeah, I love uh, that. Yeah, and you know, like with anything, there's always, you know, could be fluctuations in, in, in values. And, uh, and also, we would always talk to the clients about their personal risk tolerance yeah. uh, in their circumstances. And, and hopefully, we do that well for you. Yeah, that's great. And, and this is pretty much exactly what I do. I, I've never actually done it with the HELOC because I've had enough investment properties accumulate that I've just refinanced my investment properties. But um, you know, some of my most successful clients are tapping into their home equity. And, um, you know, I think Peter will talk a little bit more about it, but there's like, you know, significant tax advantages for doing it that way as well. Uh, next stage, uh, when you do have, um, when you're making an offer and then you have an accepted offer to purchase, first thing to consider is uh, how are you going to take title? And most people, when they buy their principal residence, it makes sense to purchase it under their personal name because um, at, at this point still, um, capital appreciation is 
uh, exempt from, um, uh, from paying taxes on a principal residence, but that's not the case when it comes to investment properties. Uh, Peter is going to talk to you more about it in his section about pros and cons of setting up uh, a holding company. Um, so th that, that's, but that's a very important consideration. Before you go ahead and, and, and purchase an investment property, it's, it's a very good idea to talk to the accountant to decide how are you going to be owning title in those properties. Uh, once I, you have I would like to, to sort of jump in, Joanna. I just want to add one thing. And, and I know like, you know, it, it, sometimes people don't often talk about it, but when you buy under a holding corp and you get a mortgage from certain lenders, when you go and get financing from another lender on another property, they only pull your personal credit report and ask you what real estate you own in your name personally. And that has really been one of the biggest things for me to allow me to get as many mortgages as I have. Um, you know, a lot of those properties are owned with partners that have allowed me to, to buy more, but also by buying under a holding corp and not having that property show up on my personal credit um, credit report is, is probably the, the most important reason for me to, to if, if anyone wants to accumulate a lot of real estate, that's very important. And you work with lenders that do that, right? That'll finance through holding corps. Um, absolutely. Uh, you know, most banks do offer uh, financing through the hold costs. And, you know, when it comes to investment uh, properties, just uh, similarly, when you go and apply for your personal mortgage and you have uh, debt under your corporation or under your active business, the banks um, often, you know, don't get into that. They just right. focus on personal assets and liabilities um, in most cases. Uh, when it comes to, um, so, so the lawyer, so once you, you know, with the new construction agreements, you, you do have a 10-day period to, to review the details. At that point, you would bring the agreement to the lawyer to review, and you would also, you know, they would review the details, and they would also give you an idea of estimated closing costs. That's a little bit different on new construction. Um, when it comes to, um, to financing, you know, it's very hard to tell exactly what things are going to look like uh, three, four, five years down the road. Uh, and there's a few different ways of, um, uh, of what can happen when you're putting an offer on that new construction uh, project. Um, there is often a bank on site uh, that may be able to have a, a special offer where they will hold rates for um, often up to three years uh, on the specific product, which gives you a little bit of rate certainty. Uh, that said, those rates, because the bank is hedging their bets three years out, uh, those rates uh, that are um, called the builder rate cap are not current rates. Uh, they are always um, one or even 2% higher than the current rate, but they kind of guarantee clients worst case scenario. Uh, some lenders might uh, provide certain amount of guarantee of uh, of approval a uh, few years out, but um, similarly to, you know, when you take a mortgage on any one of your properties, most terms in Canada, people take a variable or up to a five-year term and therefore renegotiation anyway. So there's always interest rate risk, I think, with, uh, with any property. Um, why builder needs the pre-approval letter is because when, you know, sometimes people say, well, I don't know in five years where things are going to be at. Uh, but uh, the builder, in order to get their site financing organized, um, they need to show that the people who are buying are covered for their down payment as well as, as the financing so that they can cover to close the transaction. Awesome. Thank you. Next <laughs> stage is the occupancy stage. Um, so as the building comes near completion, um, different units get finished. Usually units clo closer to the ground floor get finished first and then penthouses get finished last. But people are slowly starting to move in into the property. Um, and when you do receive the keys, that's called the occupancy stage. Uh, upon occupancy, you are renting from the builder and paying occupancy fees until 90, 85 or 90% of a building is uh, occupied when the builder goes to the city and registers condo corp. And at that point, um, you, um, you would be taking ownership at registration. So in this stage at occupancy, before you get the keys, uh, this is kind of a final stretch before, um, uh, before the building is finished. So at that stage, 
uh, you're going to need to firm up your, your mortgage options. Um, if you did uh, decide to go with one of the lenders that gave you that worst case scenario on the um, rate hold, you can review that, but also compare that to current market rates available at the time. You're free to shop for, for best mortgage that you can uh, find or you know work with your advisor or welcome to work with us. Uh, but you're going to need a firm mortgage commitment in order in order to get to the occupancy. So that has to, you know, once you're, you're getting your notice three months out, that's the time to get it all uh, organized. Um, it's also a good time to lock in as well, because, you know, occupancy could be delayed six months or whatever. If you can lock in, that's that's always good. Yeah, very good point. Uh, when it, you know, for, for some clients, they actually, some, some clients never intend to go into, to close on a property. Uh, or maybe their circumstances change and, and now they have trouble qualifying for a mortgage or just life changed. Um, I know that Ryan's in, on most projects is able to usually negotiate an assignment. Um, and uh, this is something we're going to talk to um, talk about in more detail uh, with when it comes to taxation. But what assignment is, is the opportunity to take that purchase agreement contract that you have and assign it to another buyer at the current market value uh, without closing on the transaction. So in other words, what that means is that someone buys your, so let's say you bought that condo for uh, 500,000 and now four years later, it's worth 600,000. Someone it might be able to buy your original contract and pay you the difference without you having to close on a transaction. And Ryan, do you want to jump in? Yeah, well, I, I think Peter is going to be the best one to jump in on this. But um, yeah. you know, I always look at what is left in your pocket to reinvent, reinvest, um, because I want to buy more and more and more real estate. And I used to look at assignments as not having much money in your pocket to reinvest. But um, Peter enlightened me, and, and I'm still learning too. But uh, um, you know, if you'd sell an assignment through a corporation, um, you know, I don't want to ruin your slide if you have this, here, but maybe just talk quickly on it, uh, what the tax implications are versus doing it in your name, because then it makes a lot of sense to start assigning properties. If you want short term money versus long term, uh, you know, cash flow is important, more important than capital appreciation. This might be the way you go. You just start assigning properties every year. Yeah, so just I want to mention that, you know, an assignment, uh, CRS, it sees this as a, as a business transaction, like you flip right away your prop the property. Uh, and uh, it's a business, uh, you know, it's a, become a business income. Now, the question is, is it going to be under your name or is it going to be under a corporation? And the huge bit different between the, the two options. Uh, so, you, you know, it's something that I'm going to be discussing later on on my uh, in the slides. Uh, on my presentation, so right. something to pay attention. Um, yeah, and also the, when you get the keys to the unit at that stage, you can also start getting the rental income coming in, which will offset uh, your, usually more than offset your occupancy fees. Uh, so you have additional income coming in at that point until, um, until registration. Yeah, and I wanted to make one point to that and then your first point as well with the occupancy fee, I've been buying real estate for a long time. I've never had my occupancy be uh, occupancy fee be uh, more than what I'm getting for rent on my condo. Um, you know that could change, but historically speaking, that has always been a great time for me to cash flow. And even though you're quote unquote paying rent to the, the developer through your occupancy fee, it's a good time to put money in your pocket and then put towards your your closing costs um, when you you close on it. And I always make sure we, our clients are allowed to rent during occupancy as well. Sometimes you're not allowed to, and that could be uh, you know, a big problem. Oh, for sure. Uh, and when we get to the registration stage, uh, you know, this is, could be you know, five years later, is once, um, this is when you actually uh, get the deed and ownership to the unit. This is when you're funding your mortgage, uh, and this is a final closing. So what happens at the final closing? There's you know, a vanilla kind of transaction where uh, in scenario one, you can just close uh, your purchase as any other transaction. You, you bought it for, you bought that condo, but we used an example for 500,000 and then you're going to close it um, uh, based on the original purchase price minus the deposits you paid. 
Uh, but in that situation too, there is a possibility of step two, where you immediately turn around and refinance it at the current market value. Uh, the scenario one, uh, I'll show in, 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 in good detail on the next page, but this is for clients who fully qualify through, through a major bank or a lender. Uh, the other scenario is um, where you might be able to, ref instead of closing based on the original purchase price, where you right away close on, uh, on the higher, hopefully higher uh, value at the market value. Yeah. Uh, so first scenario, when we fund a purchase first and then the refi the refinance the property at the market value, uh, just starting with the assumptions here, uh, on you, you have your original purchase of 500,000. Um, the market value after five years in our example uh, was 638,000. That's based on annual appreciation of 5%. Uh, and we keep in mind that we already took out 100,000 from our home equity line of credit on our house and used it as a, as a down payment on that transaction. Uh, so what I'd happens- I'd love to see here, the return on that. That'd be very high. Pardon? I'd love to see the return on that if you're using <laughs> borrowed money to, to, to make that, this kind of money. Yeah, well, I think we're going to get there. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so this is a, just a simple example, purchase price less down payment equals mortgage. And we're assuming that uh, land transfer tax, HST legal closing costs, which the lawyer discussed with you would be covered uh, from your own sources. Um, with that in mind, you're able to go back to the bank uh, and refinance that property based on the current market value. Uh, if the if the value is appraised value is what we thought as a market value at six hundred thirty eight thousand, you can um, if you qualify you can go as high as eighty percent of uh, of that value, which gets you to um, the financing amount of five hundred and ten thousand. So you bought this unit for for five hundred thousand, and right after closing five years later, you could finance it for. 510, uh, which is, I think, pretty uh, incredible. And I think that's extremely conservative, too. I, I haven't seen like 5% compounded annual growth is very low compared to even the 45 year average. But uh, what yeah, can I say, Ryan? I'm a banker. So <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I can't help it. Uh, but in, in this step two here, you know, when you have a $510,000 refinance and you pay off the 400, which you took out in the first place, that gives you a surplus of 110,000. Uh, this can be used to pay down your HELOC, which you use for deposit or to replenish savings or towards the purchase of your next property. Scenario two is a more expensive scenario. Um, and this is kind of, we're skipping step one and going straight to step two. Uh, this is for clients who will close based on the current market value. And uh, it, you know, it used to be possible at the banks, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, right now, you know, we've, we haven't seen any banks uh, do that in one step. Uh, so there are other alternative lenders that will allow to do it, where you could right away close based on the market value of the property and finance um, up to 80%. Uh, and if you had your um, balance remaining in our scenario, you know, we, we needed another 400,000 to close, then right at closing, you could uh, have the additional funds. And in some cases, clients, um, would use that strategy because they do need the proceeds to pay for their uh, closing costs, land transfer taxes, and so forth. Uh, in other cases, um, clients might might do that because something their financial situation changed and they don't qualify through uh, through the bank and they want to restructure it. Um, I just need Sorry. to come back. Thank Sorry. you. Uh, so there's two types of scenarios here. Uh, this could be a situation where um, clients who, uh, who, want to who want to maximize their equity or might not qualify for a traditional mortgage, but still is qualified. We have some A minus options where financing rates will be uh, slightly um, higher than traditional mortgages, but it will still allow them perhaps a, big, a larger borrowing power. And in those scenarios, you really have to think that on an investment property, let's say your mortgage rate is three and a half percent. 
uh, but your property appreciates at 5%. Uh, so not only that mortgage is tax deductible against the rental income, uh, mortgage is only a portion of the property value, while the whole asset is hopefully historically appreciating at a higher uh, amount. And lots of clients have have hard time thinking about that because on your principal residence, it is crucial, you know, you, you want to pay off that mortgage as fast as you can and, and get the lowest rate possible because it's not a tax deductible debt. When it comes to rental properties, here you have a number of assets that, that is appreciating uh, and that interest is not, um, not as, it's a tax deduction anyway, right? Uh, which is helpful. Uh, with, a, with the other option, short-term solution for private lenders, in some cases, you know, clients will close on the property or need to close on the property, uh, but no, don't qualify for financing or uh, have other circumstances uh, where private funds can, um, can be arranged as a short-term solution. Uh, other considerations that we're looking at, uh, you know, with every single client, this is a general presentation. When we sit down with a client, we, we are trying to customize options for them and a plan that will work uh, for their situation within just looking at their whole um, portfolio investment strategy and also risk tolerance. Uh, in some cases, clients might want flexible cash flow options uh, like the home equity iron of credit, where they are going to have a low minimum payment. Um, and they want the cash flow flexibility, or maybe they just get chunks of money at, at different points in time. Um, our clients might uh, want to set up a credit facility where they have access to re-advanceable credit, uh, where they have maybe something like, to use as an example, Scotia Bank as a product where they have a mortgage, when you can have a mortgage on a line of credit components. And as you pay down your mortgage, more money becomes available on a line of credit. Um, we have a variety of options that we can discuss with the individual and, and see what makes sense. Um, there is another, you know, private financing is, 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 is something that we can offer in circumstances where, where it makes sense. Um, the product that is less known, but very popular with clients who get to the point where they might have so many rental properties that they have trouble uh, qualifying through the bank uh, is a blanket mortgage uh, product. Um, one of the banks has, um, has this option where they start looking at the rental portfolio, rental portfolio of residential properties as a commercial uh, lender. So what they will do is they're not going to look at, uh, obviously the individual has to have some credit worthiness, but they don't determine borrowing the normal way that we would if someone is just buying one rental condo, but they look at the cash flow on the rental portfolio and that determines uh, loan to value. Um, this is a, a really interesting vehicle for clients with multiple, like we're talking 20, 30, 40 rentals for clients who hold large portfolios. Uh, it's a very viable solution that we can, again, Yeah, I, I was surprised when you told me about that earlier. We're going to talk about that later. Um, yeah, do you want to just wrap it up then, Joanna? And, and you know, I, I, there's going to be, we have your, your website down here, but we're going to have uh, and your contact information. So um, is there any better way for people to get in touch with you and your team? Uh, the best way is to send an email to hello at outline.ca. Uh, I have um, just maybe a little in about outline. Uh, we don't really have salespeople at outline. Every single person who works at outline has to be an underwriter first. Uh, so when you do talk to us, um, the difference that you get is that when you are looking for investment advice, uh, you're going to get a, a big amount of questions because we need to understand who you are, what's important to you and all of your current financial details and also uh, your goals. And then we can help you uh, build a plan or help you um, Work out, work out different numbers, but uh, we, we are very different uh, and everybody who works for us has to be an expert underwriter before they can talk to clients, which uh, is not the norm in the industry, but that's how we like it uh, because I think it adds value. 
Great. Thank you, Joanna. Peter, mm -hmm. I'm going to hand it over to you now. So this is where we're going to, I've got a lot of questions coming in, both financing questions, uh, a lot of tax questions. So we're going to get to all of that at the end for those of you who stuck around. We actually have more people on now than when we started. We've got over uh, 220 now. So that's exciting. Um, and then we'll we'll jump into the Q&A at the end. So uh, Peter, uh, go ahead and take it away. And quickly, I'll just let everyone know that I know Violet and Jessica from your team are here as well. So uh, you may hear from them as well. Okay, yes. Uh, hi, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, what I'm going to be trying to do, I'm trying to uh, look into a tax strategy for a real estate, real estate investment. I'll try to make it as simple as possible so it's not going to be that complicated. I will uh, give you some examples uh, and hopefully you will get an idea more or less at the end of this uh, session uh, about uh, real estate investment and the tax strategy. Uh, we'll start with the four type of ownership. There are four, actually four types of, type of ownership that you can uh, own a property. Uh, one is a, a sole proprietorship, general partnership, limited partnership, and a corporation. When it comes to the sole proprietorship, usually uh, we would suggest it when the, uh, the value and the risk are very low mainly because there is not limited liability protection for, uh, for a sole proprietor. Similarly, in a general partnership, uh, again, there is no limited part uh, li liability protection. A uh, limited uh, general partnership is uh, two people or more, usually uh, are a family member. And uh, the idea over here is to try uh, and minimum, minimize taxes by uh, having a family member with a low uh, in, uh, tax rate. So you can add them as a, uh, as a part of the, of the ownership of the property. That way they will pay less income tax. Uh, that's important. So this, a general partnership isn't necessarily if me and my friend want to go buy a condo together, or is it? Uh, it, you, you can. I mean, definitely you can. Yeah. You, can have, you can have a general partnership, you and your, uh, and your friend. And, but don't forget, as long as if it's under your name, it's both names, tax, you are going to be taxed on your portion of the, of the shares of this uh, property. So if I was on title with my friend or a partner, could I, would I have to add my wife? or other significant other to? Well, if, you're, yeah, if your wife has a low income, uh, she's, let's say, on a, high, on a low tax rate, I would recommend to, yes, add her or even put her as a, par as a partner in a, in a general partnership. Yeah, that's great. So I just want to jump learning. in quickly here. When it comes to financing, uh, if, you're, if you have it on a, your personal taxes that you have a property that you're a 50% owner, and when we do financing, um, different banks have different rental offsets, but if there is a shortfall, um, then you're getting 100% of that shortfall, or you have 50% of the asset on your uh, personal debt calculations, which can not always be favorable. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Okay, a limited partnership. Uh, it's another option of uh, um, handling a real estate investment. So a limited partnership, usually it's a group of people you, who go and purchase an asset uh, through, I mean, large valuable assets such as a plaza or a shopping mall, that type of things. Uh, this is good for people who doesn't want to get involved with the process of buying, renting and, and handling a property. And so it's, it's a hassle-free type of uh, real estate investment. Okay. And the last option is of course, uh, a corporation. Having a corporation, there are uh, a lot of advantages. There are a lot of flexibility over there. Uh, one of the main important things was obviously the limited liability, liability protection. And in this situation, obviously, if there is any lawsuits, uh, again, uh, your assets are going to be protected. Also, we are going to be uh, uh, if in a situation when you are looking at estate planning, uh, passing those property through a corporation is much is much better uh, and you'll be able to save tax on land transfer tax you'll be able to save tax on probate and so on 
Yeah, one other thing I just want to add to it, I know I touched on it earlier, but I, I set up all my properties under a corporation for these exact reasons. And then what I learned through financing was the most significant reason for me to have my properties under a corporation was that they weren't showing up on my personal credit book report and banks often didn't want to know about them because it was owned by a separate entity and not by Ryan Coyle. Um, so many, many advantages of buying in a corporation. Um, Peter, before I move on, um, I, I, and I'm jumping ahead to a question, I just know it's the most common question and we're right here. Can someone move title of an existing property from their name to a corporation? Yes, the, definitely. So uh, moving a pro, a, 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 a property from a self, I mean, from your uh, name to a corporation can be done by uh, on the income tax act by, by section 85. So you will be able to uh, move the value at uh, the book value uh, of the property to a corporation. Uh, now there is obviously something that we need to look at. It is, uh, it is only on the paper. It's not actually on your, uh, on the deed of the property. So, so how do we change it to the deed? Is that a question for a lawyer? That's a question for a lawyer. Going. Yeah, there's a question for a lawyer. And in many situations, we get mis uh, answers from lawyers. Some lawyer will say there is a land transfer tax involved here, and some will say no. Uh, so my understanding of it is that you can, there's a way of do it. There's a way to do it. There's, there's two. Um, the one way it will trigger land transfer taxes for sure. Uh, I don't know that that's accurate, but um, it's a very popular question. So for everyone listening, I'll be sure to get a lawyer on next time we could talk about that. Yeah. Okay, let's look at the real estate investment and the income. What, what happened when, when it comes to the income tax uh, when you generated the income from the properties? Uh, so the mon I mean, the most common one, uh, there are the rental income and the capital gain when you sell the property. Uh, however, we have, to look, we have to look at that from a tax point of view, from CRA point of view, what happened uh, in, in a situation when you have a long-term rental and a short-term rental. So for the long-term uh, uh, rental, from a CRA point of view, it's considered to be a passive income. You are going to be paying tax on the net uh, rental income, meaning you have the income from the, uh, from the rent and then you have expenses. The expenses are limited to the type of expenses related to the property. So you cannot uh, uh, generate extra expenses. The most common expenses that you can deduct on the rental income would be uh, the uh, property insurance, uh, property taxes, um, mortgage interest, maintenance and repair and utilities. However, if you are uh, renting the properties uh, on a short term, such as Airbnb, uh, in this situation, CRE, CRA would say this is actually a business income. It's not an investment income. Uh, okay. And business ex income is taxed differently. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, so before, yeah. So, the, why, so there are a few things when it comes to the business income. Uh, one of them, uh, if you go back a little bit uh, to one, back to the slide, I just wanted to mention, yeah, so when it comes to the short-term uh, rental, uh, rental uh, in this situation, you have to remember that if the gross income of, uh, uh, of that, you, that you generated during the year is over $30,000, uh, you must register for HST in this situation. So you'll have to collect HST and you have to remit it, uh, HST to the CRA. And, and what about and when you sell the property? Okay, so when you sell the property, we will get to that later on. But what about but HST? Do we get to that? Like, do you pay sell uh, pay HST if you sell a business income property? Yes, uh, yeah. So we'll have yes, of course. So what's going to happen? We will get to the selling of the okay. property later on in a capital gain and, and the selling as a business income. Right. I just wanted to mention that on uh, on the active uh, business, which means on the short term investment, you should be able to claim more expenses. So in a short-term investment, since it is a business income, you'll be able to claim, say, let's say, uh, home office expenses, uh, uh, internet, telephone, car expenses, those type of thing, which you cannot do when you are renting uh, for the long terms. Let's look at an example of a, of a tax, uh, tax to pay on the rental income. And this is for passive income. This is for the long term. 
So I'll give you an example over here when it comes to a personal versus a corporation. So let's assume an individual has a general income of $100,000 and they have a rental income. It could be from one property, it could be from several properties. And the net income of the rental is $50,000. In this situation, that their taxes are gonna be 21,700. Now you will be surprised, but under a corporation, it will be 50% tax uh, on a passive income. Uh, the idea is CRA doesn't like the idea of uh, you um, having an um, investment, passive investment inside a corporation. Later on, I will discuss, I mean, the options of how to, uh, how to go uh, to overcome those kind of uh, difficulties when it comes to the taxes. But uh, in our example right now, it will be better on a passive income, it would be better to be under the personal uh, rather than a corporation. Right. What happened next? Yeah. What happened when it comes to the uh, active rental income? Meaning, like I mentioned before, Airbnb, uh, recreation properties, those type of thing for a short term. CRA, like I mentioned before, CRA see this as a business income. And therefore, you will have to pay like business income tax on that. Uh, in this situation, there is no much of a diff if the same, same scenario as we had before, uh, the, diff the taxes on a personal level is going to be the same, $21,700, while in a corporation, you can see the big difference, uh, you are going to be paying only 12.2%. So active business is considered by CRA, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, low, it's uh, giving you the lower tax. And over on the active on the corporation with the active business, you're paying only 12.2%. So that's a huge benefit for a tax savings. Now, the next step is what happened when you sell the property? So when you sell a property, uh, most people uh, know that you you would most likely generate a capital gain. And uh, when it comes to capital gain, 50% of the gain is exempt from tax. So you only pay tax on 50% of the gain. And the way you pay the tax is you just add the 50% into your uh, marginal tax taxable rate and you pay the tax right on your personal tax if it's inside your uh, personal uh, name. When it comes to, and if it's an corporation, you, you will pay this, it's gonna be more or less the same type of tax. Also a corporation has the 50% exemption. Now, when it comes to the business income, when you flip a, a properties, for example, like we had before when Joanna mentioned the, in, in her um, presentation, when you buy a property and just before you close, you sell it as an assignment or even a short, short period after uh, closing the deal. Again, in this situation, CRA is going to review, view it as a business income. They're not going to let you get this 50% exemption. So you will be paying huge tax on this situation. Uh, and we can show you the example. Now, but before I get you the example, I just wanted to show to uh, give you an idea how CRA determine if you have a capital gain or if you have a business income. So the most uh, important part uh, when it comes to, uh, to determine if it's a capital gain or business income is the intention. What was the original intention? So let's assume you buy a pre-construction uh, property the main important thing is what was the original intention? Why did you buy the property? Did you buy the property in order you to rent it later on? If, if so, then that's become investment property, which means you'll be able to claim capital gain. How, uh, however, what happened if your intention was to flip it? Let's say to wait for the four years when it's ready, then you sell it. In this situation, CRE, def CRE definitely is going to make a decision that it is a business income. I can, I can give you an example uh, that we had in our, uh, in our office uh, once. We have a situation when the client uh, purchased a property with the intention to have the property in downtown Toronto, to have the property 
prepared for the son who is going to be uh, attending university at U of T. The son was, you know, 14 years old at that time, and, and the family prepared for, for the situation. What happened, uh, the son eventually, after the four years, eventually uh, admitted to uh, Waterloo University rather than uh, U of T. So obviously the family did not need the property and they decided to sell it. So it was sold just before closing. CRA came and assessed the client for business income, you know, so, uh, and, and the business income was like quite huge. I mean, it was about $200,000 of taxes uh, plus HST that they have to pay. We send an appeal uh, to CRA. We, we appealed this decision and we won eventually. The reason we won is mainly because we, the intention of this uh, transaction was to buy the property for the child to live in while they are attending university. Uh, we had to provide all the documentation to show that he applied for UFT and was not accepted, and he was accepted in Waterloo. When we sent this appeal, uh, after that, uh, I had discussed this information with the, with the appeal division, and they accepted, and they changed the assessment from a, a business income to capital gain. Other criteria that CRA is going to is usually looking at that is what's the behavior? What kind of behavior do you have on a regular basis? Do you, do you often buy property and sell them uh, or, or do you keep them for a long period of time? So this is something that they're looking at that. Uh, if what, I sign how something, I'll, I'll be triggered as, as full income. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the other thing they're looking is uh, how much knowledge do you have? So, for example, in our, in my example before, so what I've told, I mean, what I've told the, to the, to the um, uh, auditor from CRA, I told them, hey, listen, uh, the, the child doesn't have any knowledge of, of rental property. He doesn't know I mean, of uh, real estate property. He's just 18 years of age. Uh, and so they don't really have any knowledge. And, and that's one of the things that uh, caused uh, to, to show that uh, uh, the actual uh, assessment of CRA is incorrect. Uh, the other thing they're looking, of course, is the duration of the ownership. So if you buy and sell uh, quite often, or if you buy and keep, uh, uh, then what the, in that situation, uh, it's going to be uh, investment. Uh, how long do you keep the, uh, the term of the mortgage? Do you have it open, variable open, or do you have it uh, uh, five years fixed? Those are the type of, of uh, question that CRA is going to, uh, to look at it. So let's, let's look at an example of taxes, what happened uh, in, in a different situation. So when it comes to capital gain, uh, let's look at the example uh, over here and compare individual compared to a corporation. Capital gain, like I mentioned before, 50% of the gain is exempt and the other 50% turn to be part of your income and you pay uh, on, on, a, on let's assume on a gain of, of 400,000, the tax that individual will pay in, in a situation like us, uh, $100,000. Corporation is gonna be the same. There is no much of a difference between a, a corporation or individual when it comes to capital gain. The only difference is because of the fact that 50% of the gain is exempt from tax, the shareholder entitled to pull out 200,000 in this our situation, 200,000, which is the 50% tax free from the corporation. The other thing that I need to mention is in a situation uh, when a shareholder decided to take a dividend from a corporation, the corporation will get a, a, a reduction of tax by of 38%. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. Okay, the other, I mean, the, the, the situation of active business, uh, and I think, Ryan, that's what the question that you have, what happened if you sell a, a, a property which is in active business? So let's have the same scenario. Uh, as individual with $100,000 general income has a gain of $400,000. CRA come and say, hey, you flip the property. You will have to pay the full, the full gain become uh, uh, income for you. In, in this situation, the tax are going to be two hundred and eight thousand dollars. On the other hand, if you if you close the deal under a corporation, you will get 
a huge difference of, of tax. You will only pay 12.2% because the $400,000 is fully taxed, but it is considered to be a business income. It's not, yeah. it's not a, a, a capital gain or the, it's, it's actually a business income. Therefore, you only pay 12.2%, which is which is $48,000, $48,800. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's, yeah. it's significant. I mean, especially if you want to keep investing and keep investing, you want to be able to defer all of those taxes or, or, or you know, I guess not have to pay them and then you'll, you'll build that in the corporation. Um, yeah, that's so the, awesome. key, the, key, the key over here is to make sure the transaction is under the corporation, not yeah. under your personal. So anyone listening, if you're signing properties and you're not just doing one, you're planning on making um, you know, business or an income out of this, it's very important to have it under a corporation. Um, you know, you could talk to me later about how to structure that in terms of uh, the original agreement or purchase and sale. Um, but Peter, let me ask you this. So say I did this for five years and I bought 10 condos and I accumulated 1.6 million um, in tax savings. What does it look like when I start taking that money out of the corporation to you know, fund my retirement or something like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's that's a good question. Uh, okay, so money sitting in a corporation, like I said, I mean, it's one of the advantage is you can, you have more flexibility. So you don't pay tax, you pay tax when the corporation is making the money, but you don't pay personal income tax until you take the money from the corporation. Right. So the way I look at that in many situations, I tell the client, you know what, make, sh- make your corporation your retirement savings plans. And then you keep the money in there. And then only when you retire, you start taking the money. Yeah. Now, uh, the, the flexibility is, uh, is, 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 is big. So number one, you should be able to uh, take the money as a dividend. Yeah. yeah. If you take money as a dividend, you'll be able to pay less income tax because of the fact that the corporation has already paid some taxes. So that there is no double taxation. You paid a corporation pay 12.2%. You will pay... Uh, less income tax when you take the money. How much? Depends on your tax rate. It depends on how much dividend you're going to take. So you can structure the way the, the, the money that you pull out from a corporation uh, the way you, you want, but do it in planning. Plan it with your accountant to make sure you're paying the low tax rate. Yeah. That's, yeah. Okay. Okay, let's look at the tax tips. So there are several uh, tips that I mentioned. Uh, and the first one, actually, that the first tip is what I just was talking about. You de- defer your uh, income by s- keeping the money inside the corporation, and then you will have an option either to take it as a dividend or to take it as a salary. So that's something that, uh, that I, you know, I already talked about it. The other thing is when you have a real estate investment, you have to remember that you have an opportunity over here to share, to split some income. And splitting the in- income mm-hmm. with the family member who has a low tax rate, you can pay them some sort of a management fee for them looking after the properties. Okay, so this is very good when you, when you have, uh, you know, a, a teenager, uh, children, and, and you want to, first of all, you want to get them, get involved with the, you know, with the business of the family business. So you make sure to, put, uh, to pay them a manage, fee, management fee for the, for the process of their work. Now, you have to remember, do it property and do it right. If you don't do it right, you can, you can get challenged by CRA and they make this allow, disqualify your, uh, your uh, claim. So do it right. What I'm saying, I, what I usually say to my client, uh, create some sort of Excel worksheet, uh, mark down uh, all the transaction, all the activity that the children were doing while they are looking after the property. Uh, make, make sure the number of hours that is right there and you make a payment to them. So uh, you really need to make a payment, move the money from your account to their account. If they don't have an account, you have to open an account for them. If they are uh, underage, you, you open an account in trust for them and you move the money over there. We, we take one step uh, extra by uh, even issuing a T4 at the end of the year. So that way you are protected. So CRA cannot come and challenge you on these things. Okay, it's uh, the other option is the property management, property management corporation. So property management corporation is what happens if you don't have a family member or you don't have a family member with a low tax rate. So what do you do? 
So opening a property management corporation is another tool for you to reduce taxes. So like we said before, on a passive income, you pay higher income tax, close to 50%. But if what happens if you open a property management corporation that manage your corporation, you move money, you flow money from uh, the passive income into the property management corporation and a property management corporation, you pay 12.2% tax, which is a very low taxes. And that's how you will save taxes. Um, I like also to mention about the HST housing rebate. So many people just are aware that the HST housing rebate is uh, is available for uh, pre-construction uh, properties for for the individual who go and live in those property. But that's not 100% correct. There, it is part of it, and the other part is if you rent the properties, you will also entitled for this uh, new housing rental rebate. Okay, so it's very important that uh, you will be able, because the, this is a 24, almost $24,000 that you can get back uh, for the new yeah, housing. Someone rebate. told me a statistic a few years ago about the amount of money that hasn't been claimed back for HST rebates. I can't remember what it was, but it was, yeah. it was staggering. I mean, I, exactly, exactly, million, quite often. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So quite often people don't, they're not aware that they are entitled to get this $24,000. So right. it's very important to, to know that. And the last, uh, the last tip that I have over here, I think Joanna mentioned it and Ryan mentioned it before, is converting your um, principal resident mortgage. Like when you have a mortgage uh, under the principal resident, we all know that there, there is no deduction that you can claim on this mortgage, but you do still pay it. You know, you pay every month more your mortgage, your, when you pay interest on the mortgage. Uh, and the idea is uh, to uh, move uh, money that you available to you into that mortgage and create a home equity line of credit and borrow this money. You borrow money from the home equity line of credit and reinvest it. You can reinvest in a property. You can reinvest in the stock market. But when you do this transaction, because the, invest, the loan is actually taken for investment, you are entitled to claim the interest on, on the loan. Awesome. Okay. The other thing, I mean, and I just mentioned very briefly, there is a way to structure your corporation. Like if you have several corporation, cor several property that you own, uh, it's a good idea to structure it proper so uh, you don't get surprised at the, at the end. So uh, what we recommend is having a holding company and the hol holding company owns each of the uh, rental corporation. The holding company also own the management corporation. And like I mentioned before, the rental corporate, I mean, the management corporation is going to be charging fees for their services. The fee that the management corporation are charged are going to be taxed at a lower rate. And, and that says reduces the net income of the rental corporation. If there is any question, we'll be more, more than happy to help. Yeah, I just want to point out, I mean, like this is somewhat technical and some of the things you and Joanna and, and, and me as well are, are probably technical for some or, or most. And, um, you know, we'll get into Q&As now, but, um, you know, I think it's really important that you guys reach out to us if you have any more detailed questions. Uh, Peter or, or someone on his team will be able to walk you through kind of structuring it the right way and, and look at the numbers and look at uh, why it's important for you to do that. Or maybe it isn't, maybe you don't have enough properties. So uh, I've got a lot of questions and uh, I'll start with Joanna. The first one is if you have to wait three years to close on a pre-con purchase, does it mean you can refi upon closing slash registration or how many months after? Assumably, assuming there has been equity growth. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, depending on a, on a lender, um, with few major banks, that we actually set it up as a two-step process that's uh, done within a couple a month or two of each other, uh, where we would uh, set up the original mortgage, but register a higher charge right, right away, and then yeah. subsequently submit a refinance application to the same bank to pull out equity. Um, they, we set their expectation up front that that's what's happening. They just currently don't offer one step process. Yeah. Yeah. I know RBC, I'm doing that with the one actually I gave the example of, uh, that's with RBC and I have to wait 90 days with RBC. 
Uh, I'm doing one closing, I think tomorrow with CIBC and I'll be doing a refinance uh, within a few days. Um, there's also nuances to that. Um, if, if you pay cash and you don't take out a mortgage, it's often easier to get the, the refinance done in my experience anyway. And we've also seen people who might have larger home equity line on their house. They just pay it through the HELOC yeah, exactly. and pay it yeah. back to themselves uh, through, um, so we do mortgage on a purchase as a refinance right away that way as well. That's pretty- Yeah, I, I just had a really good client of mine do, do exactly that. And he owns a lot of real estate. So yeah, that's a good way of doing it. Uh, Joanna, when using your HELOC as a source of deposit, how much will that impact your ability to qualify in terms of the ratios? Uh, any, uh, so most banks uh, will factor in um, balance owing on a HELOC uh, into, the, into your borrowing power because any personal debt that you have will be factored in. Uh, some banks, this is actually a good learning. Uh, as of a few years ago, some banks will look at your HELOC limit um, and they factor that into your qualifying ratios and other banks will look at just HELOC balance. Uh, that's a huge difference. You could walk into one of the banks where you have a million dollar HELOC with nothing owing and they will treat it like you have nothing owing and then our bank will treat it as if you uh, owe a full balance. It's just different strategies. Right. Um, Peter, how do we get a holding corp and what are the tax benefits and implications? I know we went over, you went over the tax benefits implications. So like, how does someone set up a holding corp? Can you help them? What does that look like? Yeah. Okay. So in general, uh, a holding corp is uh, a, as a corporation that uh, usually they own, I mean, the shareholder, it will be a, a husband and wife, or it could be, uh, you know, uh, the, the family, uh, they open a corporation and this is going to be considered to be a holding corporation. Uh, when it comes to, um, Okay, so when, like when it comes to the corp the properties, I mean, like now that we mentioned, uh, all the properties are going to have uh, owned by either a, 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 corp a rental crop uh, properties, I mean, the corporation, or by the holding corporation. I mean, it's very simple process to open a, a holding corporation. Uh, the, the 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 question is, how do you structure the rest of the uh, of the uh, properties? Uh, what I wanted to mention, I mean, if you are looking at the business, it's a different, different, it's a different structure than if you have a holding corporation with the rent, with real estate investment. It's a little bit different. Right. Uh, lots coming in on holding corps. Uh, I think I talk about them a lot. Uh, how do I buy, this is for me, how do I buy in a holding co uh, company and do developers allow it? I heard developers only allow purchasers to be made in a person's name, purchases to be made in a person's name. Um, so developers, uh, for the most part, 99% of the time require an individual, a person's name to be on the agreement of purchase and sale. And you can add a second purchaser to the agreement of purchase sale as your corporation. Sometimes we like to get wording done in the form of an amendment that says, Ryan Coyle to assign to the corporation at time of close. Um, or even better, Ryan Coyle to direct title to the corporation at time of close. Because if you assign it to the corporation, they'll probably charge you $500 to $1,500 to do that. So there's different ways of doing it, but all of my properties have closed under a holding corp. Um, Peter, question for you. If I started assigning all my properties instead of closing on them, and I have to have Ryan Coyle and the holding corp, how do we make sure we do take advantage of all the tax deferrals through the holding corp? Yeah, so I mean, the question is, are you going to be closing under the holding corporation? No, so if I'm assigning the condo. Right. But it has the contracts as Ryan Coyle and my holding corp, and then I'm not closing, I'm assigning it, and I obviously want to assign it through the corp. How to, I mean, I, I know I've done that before. I didn't know kind of about the, you know. So, uh, so yeah, okay. So in, in a situation like this, the question when, when you assign it, the deal needs to be done through a corporation, through the holding corp. If it okay. does land in the holding corp, the CRA can come and challenge you. But at that point, you're going to be paying a 12.2% rather than higher tax rate. That you, you're, that's hilarious. I've always done it that way. And I didn't even know the answer. I always, when I list my assignments, I list them under the holding corp, not Ryan Coyle. It's the holding corp. And when I take it, the developer to get approved, 
they approve it. And that's how I've always been able to defer it or do it through my holding corp. Um, Joanna, this is also regarding corps. Do you need to put down more money when purchasing in a holding corp? Um, the level of down payment is determined by one's borrowing power. Um, so typically on any investment property, minimum down payment is 20% down, um, you know, within someone's qualifying power, or if it's, let's say a $3 million rental, then you might right away have to put down more, uh, more down payment, but, uh, it's individual. Yeah, guys, this is why this is so great. A holding corp for financing is why I have the portfolio I do. Um, I think it's the, the, the most important thing we could do to accumulate more wealth through real estate. And, and to Joanna's point, when you go and buy or close a property under a holding corp, they don't look at the finances of the holding corp. They look at the finances of you. And when they go and run your credit report, they don't see the other properties that are in the holding corps. Because as soon as title transfers to the holding corp, that is not your asset. That is the holding corps. And that's a really uh, important thing here. In most cases. Yeah, right. That's not always the case. Sometimes banks do factor in that you've got properties in holding corps. Absolutely. Um, Peter, can I move up? Oh, we already talked about that one. Uh, if I sell, this one's for Peter as well. If I sell my condo through assignment, is 100% of my gain taxable? I know we already talked about that. Maybe just comment uh, a reminder on what that tax rate is. Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, when you file your tax return, you would prefer to, if it's under your name, of course, you would prefer to claim it as the capital gain. However, there is a good chance the CRA is going to challenge you because the CRA right now get all the information about buying and selling properties. Uh, and if they see that they're in assignment, they're most likely going to challenge you and assess you for business income rather than a capital gain. Right. Uh, Peter, this one's for you as well. How is HST handled on an assignment? That's a good question. Good question. Uh, good question. Yes. So obviously, if CRS says that you have a business income, therefore, uh, you have also HST. Most likely, your income is going to be more than $30,000. And what they are going to be doing, they are going to charge you uh, a tax on your personal uh, with a, a, you know, full, on a full income. Plus, they are going to open for you HST account and charge you 13% on the, on the profit. The deposit. Sorry, I didn't hear. Sorry if I missed it. You may have answered. I'm just trying to get to the QA section. Um, if... if um, what about on the deposits? So when, if you collect a deposit for an assignment, is that taxed, the HST uh, taxable on the deposit amount? No, no, you are only going to be taxed on the profit, meaning the, 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 the purchase price compared to the selling price and, and any expenses in between. But so that therefore the deposit is, is part of your down payment. It's not, it's a part of the, the investment. So there is no tax on the, uh, uh, on a deposit. Okay. Um, for Joanna, um, do I need to be the guarantor of the mortgage if buying under a holding corp? Yes, absolutely. Uh, unless, you know, you have hundreds of units and uh, in a normal circumstances, if you have a few, uh, absolutely the bank will require you to personally guarantee because you're really qualifying personally uh, and uh, just putting title under hold call. Um, Joanna, in order to refinance after closing, do I have to wait until there have been MLS sales in the building to support the value or no? Um, it, you know, we would normally work with your realtor to determine, um, to get a ballpark figure for value, but, um, it depends also what the neighboring buildings are. It, it is better to get some sales in because it makes it an e easier for appraisal and lending value can be more conservative than a market value. So I would say, it often is uh, is advent advantageous. Would you agree with this, Ryan? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, Ryan, um, where do you see the market in the next year uh, and over the next few years? Um, and you guys, if you want to jump in, feel free. In, in terms of the market, I, I'm 
feeling extremely bullish on downtown, specifically downtown Toronto condos. And uh, as I mentioned before, I'll send out my webinar from last month or actually beginning of this month where I talk more about this and the market conditions and, you know, immigration and the price affordability gap between low rise and 905 and 416. And, um, you know, so I'll just touch on it quickly, but right now the price of an average condo is, um, at a record low when in comparison to the price of the average detached home in Toronto. So what that means is everyone during the pandemic wanted a backyard with a pool and a patio and the prices for low rise skyrocketed and people also left downtown Toronto for 905 because they didn't have to work in the downtown core. But what I've been saying for a long time is the fundamentals are still here. We still have a very aggressive immigration plan. We still have hundreds of thousands of international students who come here and rent our properties that are not here right now. And we're already seeing all of the extra supply that came out on the market during the pandemic um, be, be pretty much, um, you know, it's, I think we're at one month or below one month of, of supply of condos and, and re, for resale condos right now, which is unbelievably low. So that's why we're starting to see price appreciation really start to take off. Um, we just saw rents increase for the first month over month since the pandemic. Pandemic. And as soon as people actually start coming back to the city, the affordability gap between low rise and high rise is so wide that condos are going to be the only affordable option for people to get into the real estate market. And when the price gap between 905 condos and 416 is so narrow, and most people work in the 416, no one's going to buy a condo in 905. I shouldn't say no one, but the people working downtown aren't going to want to commute to work. They're going to want to live close to where they work again. So you know, I think there's so many things that have really just uh, are, 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 are such strong indicators of what's to come and, and, you know, factor in the vaccine and the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Raptors and going out for dinner again. And I think we've got a really strong market for the next uh, few years. Um, Joanna, which lenders will finance at today's value? Um, if that would be B lenders or private lenders. Okay. Okay. Um, Peter, are there advantages? I'm just going to do a few more questions. I know we had a long uh, webinar and I want to wrap it up. We all got to get back to work. Um, Peter, are there advantages to putting a property in a trust? I know I've asked you. About uh, that. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, part of the structure that we uh, prepare is, uh, uh, is to include the trust as well. So there is um, there is an, uh, uh, for estate planning, it's a good idea to um, have uh, the, the, to, to have the structure complete with the trust. Now we have to remember something uh, on the trust. If you put a, uh, a property in a trust, you will have to pay the higher tax rate. And um, so it's going to be a little bit more difficult to, uh, I would probably say it's, uh, it's not a good idea to uh, move the, the property to a trust, uh, but it will be a, a part of the structure of the whole thing to have a trust, uh, it'd be a, a, a good idea. But again, this is something that needs to be discussed with, uh, with the state plan, the state uh, lawyer who's uh, more familiar with, uh, you know, with the trust. Yeah, I think there's nuances to that. I mean, if you're already your properties are already in a, a corp, it, it's going to transfer to the estate at a much less amount than if it were in your name personally. So maybe if you own a lot personally, maybe it makes a little bit more sense. Um, yeah. but I looked into that and, and with you, and, and I'm yeah, keeping yeah. up. Than a, a okay. Um, Ryan, most developers only allow one assignment. How do you assign it from yourself to your corp then to an assignment purchaser? So it's really important. It's difficult to add purchasers to an agreement of purchase sale. Um, it's easier to remove purchasers. So when you're going to buy a property, it's really important to add you, your brother, your sister, you know, I'm just kind of making an example, but your corporation and whoever the purchasers are at that time, often you can add them later, but there's no guarantees. But when you go and um, assign your property, and you go and list that property, you're going to list it under the holding corp, not under, not under your name personally. So then the sale, the transaction of the sales between the holding corp and the new purchaser. And then when you get it assigned, it'll be pushed through that way. So it's not a double assignment. It's only assigning once. Um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's a, a lot of questions. I think we provide a lot of information. Um, again, guys, if you have more questions regarding mortgage financing, 
and accounting and structuring your, your properties, uh, please reach out to Joanna and Peter. And uh, to you too, I just want to thank you. It's always great to have experts on. And, um, you know, I even learned a little bit today and I've been doing this for a long time. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. For having thank us. you. Thanks very much. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye everyone.